Dr. James A. Naismith, the inventor of basketball. Dr. Naismith, how did you happen to invent basketball? It was in the winter of 1891 when I was physical instructor at Springfield College in Massachusetts. We had a real New England blizzard. For days, the students couldn't go outdoors, so they began roughhousing in the halls. And uh, what rules did you have for your new games, Dr. Naismith? Well, I didn't have enough, and that's where I made my big mistake. The boys began tackling, kicking and punching in the clinches. Look, this is for you, rule number five. No shouldering, holding, pushing, tripping, or striking. Yeah, we were that watching is, you play that... over here. Way to tell him, I love it. <laughs> Something had to be done. One day I had an idea. I called the boys to the gym, divided them up into teams of nine, and gave them an old soccer ball. I showed them two peach baskets I'd nailed up at each end of the gym, and I told them the idea was to throw the ball into the opposing team's peach basket. I blew a whistle, and the first game of basketball began. Include white, black, Hispanic, Asian, everybody into this beautiful game. It's an amazing story to hear of this Canadian man who invented this incredible sport for the world. And I think that's a very humble point of view, and it's an important point of view. Master planner, strategist. It is a natural, the game of basketball, to cross gender boundaries because it's all about competing and coming together and, and, and playing together as a team. and and just uh, working toward common goals. He was a builder of character. The story should be told is something that's very exciting to me. It's staggering, to be honest. It's just something that Dr. Naismith could never comprehend uh, what was going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years. People were segregated. Jewish people were playing Jewish people, blacks playing blacks. Sports has always been a place that transcends color, occupation, political philosophies, so for sure. So it doesn't surprise me that the guy that created basketball was that type of guy. Well, I just remember him as a kind gentleman. I just he's the one who started the game that I left. My dad had just brought me to the campus and said, well, you're a man now, you're going to college. Get out. <laughs> I said, aren't you going to take me to the registrar's office? No. 1933, my grandfather's 72 years old. He's sitting in his chair, first day of classes. He looks up and there's a young black kid, 18 years old, standing in the door. And he asked me, was there anything he could do to help me? And I said, yes, I'm looking for Dr. Naismith. I, I, I want to be a physical education major and I've been told he's my advisor. He said, who told you that? And I said, my dad. And he said, come on in. Dad's always right. John went to graduate school at the University of Iowa, thanks to some help from Dr. Naismith. Not only in terms of being the first black coach, he was the first one to really play fast break basketball. In 1978, John McClendon followed his teacher into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Basketball was being played all over the country. And in 1936, I saw it played for the first time at the Olympic Games. As national champions, the V8s had won the right to represent Canada in Berlin. But there was a snag. When they won the Canadian Championships in Windsor, uh, there was a few problems as far as money was concerned, because at that time the Canadian government uh, did not fund their Olympians. Jim Stewart's father, Jim Sr., was a member of the V8s. So the players on the team are going to have to find the financial means to uh, get to Germany. Mr. Fuller again the, uh, went to Ford's to see if he would fund this trip, which he did. Now I grew up in uh, the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, and basketball was the sport. We didn't have a ball. We'd get a stocking hat and fill it with paper and tie it up with a rubber band. And throw it through the lower rung on the apartment house fire escape. To this day, some of the old timers like Hubie Brown calls the game that came out of the Jewish settlement houses, Jew ball. Ozzie Sheckman, everybody knows him. He scored the first basket for the NBA. 
watching a great basketball player is like watching a great jazz artist. So I just take it back like this. Players of the Harlem Globetrotters were similar to a lot of black men in that generation. Uh, people with enormous talent who couldn't always show their talent and had to suffer great indignity just to keep food on the table. The things that I did so boys and driven the ball and the different type of shots and all, that was a part that I played. And the strength and determination of that generation just to survive laid the groundwork for people like myself. Well, I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my grandparents would take me to see them. And we had very few opportunities to see African-American you know, athletes. Enter Abe Saperstein, a white Jewish immigrant from Chicago's north side. With an entrepreneurial spirit and a love of sports, Saperstein saw a business opportunity. They wanted to play in Wisconsin, they wanted to play in Michigan, and so a white guy would have a much easier time booking those games. The style that the Globetrotters had became kind of like a style that started to pervade into the NBA game. In 1951, Berlin was still totally destroyed. Rebuilding hadn't started, so there were ruins all over the place. The U.S. State Department asked Abe Saperstein to bring his ambassadors of goodwill to Berlin Stadium. When somebody like the Globetrotters showed up in Germany, and especially in Berlin, this was a tremendous symbolic event, and it also provided relief. That kind of ambassadorship helped the image of the United States of America. And the whole thing started with a couple of peach baskets I put up in a little gym 48 years ago. I guess it just goes to show what you can do if you have to. Indeed it does. So, Cozart, director of Fast Break, see you. <laughs>